Greetings and welcome back to room 303, AP English, the Roberts Lectures, and here we are in the poetry section. We're on page 688. Um, Richard Ebert's The Fury of Aerial Bombardment. Now, Ebert, 1904 to 2005, great American poet. Um, he had more than a dozen books of poetry he published. He uh, emerged in many ways out of the 1930s as a modern stylist with romantic sensibilities, quote unquote. This has often been said of him. He was a gunnery instructor during World War II, and that will play into a number of the titles, and especially one like this. Um, let's just read the poem now. It's a 1947 offering. The Fury of Aerial Bombardment, of course, aerial bombardment when um, you know stuff comes out of the sky, especially by planes dropping bombs or maybe cannon being shot, right? Uh, pay attention, by the way, to the pronouns, you and I, in, uh, in this poem. You would think the fury of aerial bombardment would rouse God to relent. The infinite spaces are still silent. He looks on shock pride faces. History even does not know what is meant. You would feel that after so many centuries God would give man to repent. Yet he can kill as Cain could, but with multitudinous will, no further advanced than his ancient furies. Was man made stupid to see his own stupidity? Is God by definition indifferent beyond us all? Is the eternal truth man's fighting soul wherein the beast ravens in its own avidity? Of Van Wettering I speak, and Avril, names on a list whose faces I do not recall, but they are gone to early death, who late in school distinguished the belt feed lever from the belt holding pole. Well, Obviously, the fact that um, Ebert was a gunnery instructor during the Second World War does have an, an influence, no question, in our reading of this poem. Notice it begins with an interesting set of observations. You would think, the subjective mood almost, yes, uh, that is to say, maybe, maybe not, but you would think that all of the terror of war would rouse God to relent. We obviously think about biblical passages and stories like the notion of the great flood of Noah or the epic of Gilgamesh, you would think that God would just relent and maybe either wipe out humans entirely or would stop allowing humans to experience such horrific pain. Let's put it in our notes. This is without question a theodicy. That is to say, a question about the existence of pain or suffering in the world. We immediately think of Milton's Paradise Lost at 3a, don't we? Notice, the infinite spaces, however, are still. That is to say, God, has, God seems to be completely detached from this whole notion. If, if you're a deist, of course, you believe in this idea because God somehow stands outside the universe. This may be more of an atheistic observation. That is to say, if there was a God, then obviously there wouldn't be this horrific kind of pain. Notice, God looks on shock pride faces. That is to say, clearly, there is no meaning to the suffering if one is looking for God's meaning. It seems to be um, Ebert's suggestion here. And even history doesn't know what's meant. In other words, we don't seem to learn from history either. Santana's uh, great um, observation, those who uh, forget the past are damned or repeated. Well, it may be the case that those who remember the past are still damned or repeated, right? Then the second stanza, you, again, this use of the pronoun you, you would feel that after so many centuries, God would give man to repent. Now, this is an interesting use of the language, give man to repent. In other words, either God would repent or would expect man to stop killing. Yet, man, he, or God, the antecedent of the pronoun he here is a little bit vague. He can kill as Cain could, but with multitudinous will. We go back to the story of, of the early story in Genesis of Cain and Abel, right? Um, no farther advanced than in his ancient furies. Now, of course, there's multiple readings of the Cain Abel myth. As um, we have pointed out, for example, in our studies with Jordan Peterson's Genesis lectures. But notice here, the observation is from the very beginning, it seems humans wanted to jack humans, and we, we, we're still at it. What's going on? And then the questions of the third stanza. Was man made stupid to see his own stupidity? What a great, I mean, what a great uh, question. And of course, this is the question in many ways of Marcus Aurelius' meditations um, or, or any number of other philosophers who ask, why is it the case that we seem to remain stupid um, when we even recognize our own stupidity? What, a, what, what an amazing thing, right? Is God, by definition, 
indifferent, beyond us all. Notice, by definition, is an important qualifier. It is the eternal truth, man's fighting soul, wherein the beast, notice it's capitalized. We think of Milton, and of course, as Satan, or good as Faust's uh, Mespasopheles, right? In its own avidity. In other words, there seems to be our, uh, an inability for us to stop this mutually assured destruction would be the language, obviously, of the 20th century, right? M-A-D, mad, right? And then he mentions a couple of, obviously, gunners or, or individuals who came off of the farm, we might say, or out of, the, uh, you know, out of a factory or something like that to, to become soldiers. And they weren't raised to be soldiers, and obviously they died um, early because of that fact. We get um, that notion of maybe an, an anti-theodicy to some degree in regards to the Iliad and the celebration of killing and the like, right? Um, to finish now at level two, at level two A, themes, messages. Well, obviously, war and death itself is senseless, right? The popular um, 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 sentiment in, 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 in much of Ebert's poetry that somehow God seems to be indifferent to the suffering of humankind. I, I to me, want to point out the tone of this with that "you would, you would" in the first two stanzas. Um, it's a rhetorical tone, right? It's like asking the question, but already making the clear observation that something is fundamentally wrong. At 3A and how we relate to other poems, well, the other poems of, of, um, of Bieber comes come to mind. Uh, Dab Neck, Virginia will come to mind, as well as The End of the War. Uh, both, of, uh, of both of those I recommend to you. Hardy's The Man He Killed, um, obviously a text we've already worked with, and then coming cha uh, the channel firing of Hardy at 765 will echo some of these same sentiments. Randall Jarrell's Balter and Gunner, they washed him out of the turret with a hose. Think about the trajectory of this poem, how it assumes everything from the Iliad to Slaughterhouse Five on against classic. Finally, at 3B, how do you balance hope and despair in relationships to humans and their capacity to wage war? How do you do that? How do you build, how do you build some kind of balance between those two things? And where do you come down on the possibility of peace someday on the planet? Do you believe it's possible or do you not? Well, I hope this will uh, lead you to more of uh, Richard Ebert's work. It's amazing stuff. Thank you.